Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about metacognition. Thinking about thinking. As always, I'll leave the link to the article I'll be reading in the descriptions. As usual, I'll read the article word for word. Here in the end, I might interject something. But first, let me get a... It might repeat this, but I want to get a definition of metacognition out there first. So I'll read that. The term metacognition refers to the act of thinking about thinking, or the cognition of cognition. It is the ability for you to control your own thoughts. Confused? Although it is a complex construct, the definition is not complex. It is really the knowledge and regulation of cognitive phenomena, which means you can control your own thoughts. Metacognition includes the ability for you to control one person variables, knowledge about oneself and others' thinking, task variables, knowledge that different types of tasks exert different types of cognitive demands, and three, strategy variables, knowledge about cognitive and metacognitive strategies for enhancing learning and performance. So that's basically the definition of metacognition. Now, as with a lot of things I do or I talk about when I do the sciences and stuff, there is also a type of person or there are scenarios where metacognition can be bad. And for instance, if you look at the studies out there, you'll find so much with psychology and how important metacognition is. But if you use the way of searching that I like to do, which is a neutral term, just metacognition, and then a term like, what is good about metacognition? Why is metacognition good? And you can search for why is metacognition bad? What are the drawbacks with metacognition? And in doing those three types of searches, you can cut your biases out here and there, and then look at the sites and see how, you know, how much you would trust them. But what I'm getting to is there are drawbacks to everything. People will get obsessed with thinking and that type of um, mindset. It could be detrimental for people. But in general, metacognition is important, I believe. And if you go with my foundations for wellness sort of plan, teaching kids to breathe and meditate at a young age will give them tools to help with things like this. If they're the type of person who might get wrapped up in their own thoughts and, you know, use metacognition and it sort of kind of bogs down in your life. So I'll continue with the article now. This is from Psychology Notes HQ. It's the online resource for psychology students. Does this have a name? I like to give recognition first. So usually they have it at the top of the article, you know, right underneath. Uh, sorry, I don't like doing this, but <clears throat> I didn't see it right underneath, so. I I'm not, might not be able to give credit for this unless I find it down the line. All right, so I'll begin. What is metacognition? In the late 1970s, John Flavel originally coined the word metacognition. He defined the word as cognition about cognitive phenomena, or basically thinking about thinking. Definition of metacognition. Subsequent studies on metacognition describe the term comparative to Flavel's meaning. Cross and Paris, 1988, defined it as the knowledge and control children have over their own thinking and learning activities. The Hennessy, 1999, metacognition is the awareness of one's own thinking, awareness of the content of one's conception as active monitoring of one's cognitive process an attempt to regulate one's cognitive process in relationship to further learning, and an application of a set of heuristics as an effective device for helping people organize their methods of attacks in general. Although the term has been known for a long time, especially in the field of educational psychology, defining metacognition can be difficult. Until now, 
there are still debates as to what the term actually means. This confusion can be rooted from the idea that there are terms presently used to characterize the same basic phenomena, such as self-regularization, executive control, or an aspect of that phenomenon such as meta-memory. These terms are commonly used interchangeably in literature. While there are some differences between explanation of the term, the role executive processes in monitoring and regularization of cognitive methods is emphasized. Metacognition and learning. Metacognition denotes in-depth thinking in which cognitive processes involved in learning are actively controlled. This includes planning how to accomplish a given learning task, monitoring understanding, and estimating progress toward the completion of a task. It is believed that students have a greater ability to control goals, dispositions, and attention when they are more aware of their thinking process as they learn. This means that self-regularization is a result of self-awareness. For instance, when a student is aware of his lack of commitment to write his thesis and bears the knowledge that he is procrastinating, delaying, and allowing himself to be distracted by other less important things, then he could take action to get started on doing the task. This is possible only if the student becomes aware of his procrastination and takes control and planning on how to approach his thesis completion. And this is interesting, and I'm interjecting here. And when it talks about heuristics earlier, when you learn these tools and you practice them, or with critical thinking especially, they become part of you instinctively, and they become things you don't have to actively think of and do. They become, um, you know, when you're breathing and you're walking to the store, you're tying your shoes, that type of thing, that type of activity that you don't really think about. And this is like the importance of thinking about that thinking. And I like the example of the student realizing he's procrastinating. And, but this goes into my beginning thing. You'll find studies where metacognition for some students was a drawback. But I'll continue. Components of metacognition. Metacognition is divided into three components. Metacognitive knowledge. Metacognitive regulation, metacognitive experiences. Metacognitive knowledge refers to the awareness individuals possess about themselves and other people as cognitive processors. Metacognitive regulation, on the other hand, has to do with people's control over cognition and learning experiences through a set of methods that help people regulate their learning. Metacognitive experiences involve Cognitive efforts that are currently taking place. Types of metacognitive knowledge. The metacognitive knowledge component of metacognition is divided into three different types of knowledge. Declarative knowledge, procedural knowledge, conditional knowledge. Declarative knowledge refers to the factual information that we know and, com and can be both be spoken or written. This is also the knowledge about ourselves as learners and about what factors can influence our performances. Procedural knowledge refers to information on how to do something or how to perform the procedural steps that make up a task. A high degree of procedural knowledge allows us to perform tasks more automatically through a variety of strategies. Conditional knowledge refers to the knowledge about when to use a procedure skill, or strategy, or when not to. Such knowledge allows us to assign optimal resources for various tasks. Skills in Metacognitive Regulation There are three important skills in metacognitive regulation. Planning, monitoring, evaluating. Planning involves suitable selection of strategies and the right assignment of resources. Monitoring includes awareness of understanding and task performance, while evaluating refers to the assessment of the final result of a task and the efficiency carried out during the task performed. 
metacognitive strategies. Research has shown that teaching students metacognitive strategies can improve learning. Among the different learning strategies that are commonly used when studying or doing homework are rote memorization, goal setting, monitoring, self-assessing, and regulating during thinking and writing processes. So, I chose this article and a couple of others, and I was looking at the, you know, the effects of this when I talk about meditation, and I've had experiences with people who find themselves getting lost and they get um, worried or it brings more anxiety to actually sit there and think about thinking, for lack of a better word. Which is why, again, I emphasize the need to actually learn breathing techniques. Learn how to meditate and filter these things out. There are times when you want to focus and use the metacognitive skills and apply them. And there are times where you want to meditate and let everything go. And when you look at the transcendental meditation and the mindfulness you know, those aspects, and we can go out through history with these types of things. But just like anything, as I explained in the beginning, there are drawbacks to certain things. I might not highlight that in some things, but I want to make it a point here. Yes, there are people who are going to get wrapped up in their own lives, their own things that are going on. But when I look at, you know, I don't know, I was going to say the work I do. <laughs> But when I put out my stupid fucking TV show stuff and that type of thing, you know, it's having fun and, you know, talking about shows with friends and I get excited to do a podcast. But the science stuff I wanted to get across, but there's an aspect of this that anybody can better themselves. There's that chance you click the link on a stupid uh, podcast of mine in the sciences and you hear me murder the English language trying to get through these articles that I really am are out of my depth and in that process you know it's not like you have to spend three years and study it it's you know can I take a cursory review over metacognition over critical thinking you know skepticism and things like that and apply it without getting bogged down and obsessed about things and I think that's the point here there's a balance right we as human beings are just Oh, it was so complicated and complex. And I was reading another article. Like, if I read five articles here, this podcast will be hours. But there are some great articles on this metacognition. And one of the thoughts was that the difference between an amoeba and a gorilla, that vast difference is dwarfed by our ability to think about thinking compared to a gorilla. So I don't know if I'm saying that right, because... I'm summing up a fucking article. And the reason why I didn't want to use it is because it's an excerpt from a book, right? Which I think are great because, you know, right is probably a good way of doing it. It's not like a science or someone with a PhD or something that writes an article where I can verify certain things and has good links. It was an excerpt from a book. You know what? Maybe I could find that real quick because I didn't have... See, I don't prepare for this shit. I'm so... (laughs) You'd be smoking my weed and look these things up. Um... Oh, man, it might have been fucking Facebook, right? I, I mark these things out because I, I follow some great, you know, science stuff and psychology stuff. Really fascinating things. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Come on. I should be an expert at this stuff already. Or have it fucking ready and planned, right? Like, that could work. In any case, as I'm fumbling around here, you can get bogged down, and I really want to emphasize the need to breathe three to five seconds in through the nose slowly out through the mouth five to eight seconds and based on your breathing everybody has issues this and that the general gist is the breath out through your mouth is longer than the breath in through your nose and this can be your focus it could be your balance it could be the thing that cleanses you for a split second you practice enough and it becomes part of your heuristics it becomes you know, uh, instinctive and natural. You don't do things. You don't have to, you know, uh, 
actively assign effort and energy to it. It just becomes part of, you know, who you are. You, something gets surprised, something happens, and you'll find yourself in a breath, leaving out. All right, so the article was, because of our ability to think about thinking, the gap between ape and man is immeasurably greater than the one between amoeba and ape. So it's self-awareness is what makes us human. This is like, I get like a bunch of things and I go down a rabbit hole every once in a while. And this was just one of them that got me. And it's basically talking about, um, well, maybe I'll put this link in there too. Oh God, how fast can I read this? All right. Self-awareness is what makes us human. Uh, da, da, da. You can actually listen to someone professionally do it. Self-awareness, namely our capacity to think about our thoughts is central to how we perceive the world. Without self-awareness, education, literature, and other human endeavors would not be possible. Striving toward a greater awareness is the spiritual goal of many religions and philosophies. Uh, the following is an excerpt from Dr. Stephen Fleming's forthcoming book, Know Thyself. It is reprinted with permission by the author. Okay. Okay. I now run a neuroscience lab dedicated to the study of self-awareness at University College London. My team is one of several working within the Welcome Center for Human Neuroimaging, located in an elegant townhouse in Queen Square in London. The basement of our building houses large machines for brain imaging, and each group in the center uses this technology to study how different aspects of the mind and brain work, how we see, hear, remember, speak, make decisions, and so on. The students and postdocs in my lab focus on the brain's capacity for self-awareness. I find it a remarkable fact that something unique about our biology has allowed the human brain to turn its thoughts on itself. Until quite recently, however, this all seemed like nonsense. As the 19th century French philosopher Auguste Comte put it, the thinking individual cannot cut himself in two. One of the parts reasoning, while the other parts is looking on. Since this is the case, the organ observed and the observing organ are identical. How could any obs observation be made? In other words, how can the same brain turn its thoughts upon itself? Comte's arguments chimed with scientific thinking at the time. Or scientific thinking at the time. After the Enlightenment dawned on Europe, an increasingly popular view was that self-awareness was special and not something that could be studied using tools of science. Western philosophers were instead using self-reflection as a philosophical tool, much as mathematicians, mathematicians use algebra in the pursuit of new mathematical truths. René Descartes relied on self-reflection in this way to reach his famous conclusion, I think, therefore, I am. Noting along the way that I know clearly that there is nothing that can be perceived by me more easily or more clearly than my own mind. Descartes proposed that a central soul was the seat of thought and reason, commanding our bodies to act on our behalf. The soul could not be split in two. It was just, it just was. Self-awareness was therefore mysterious and indefinable, and off limits to science. We now know that the pre premise of Comte's worry is false. The human brain is not a single individual organ, indivisible organ. Instead, the brain is made up of billions of small components, neurons, that crack that each crackle with electricity, electrical activity, and participate in writing in wiring diagram of mind-boggling complexity. See so what happens when I murder the language and I try to get through this fast? Uh, neurons that each crackle with electrical activity and participate in a wiring diagram of mind-boggling complexity. Out of the interactions among these cells, our entire mental life, our thoughts and feelings, hopes and dreams, flickers in and out of existence. But rather than being a meaningless tangle of connections with no discernible structure, this wiring diagram also has a broader architecture that divides the brain into distinct regions, each engaged in specialized computations. Just as a map of a city need not include individual houses to be useful, we can obtain a rough overview of how different areas of the brain are working together at the scale of regions rather than individual brain cells. Some areas of the cortex are closer to the inputs, such as the eyes. The others are further up the processing chain. For instance, some regions are primarily involved in seeing 
the visual cortex at the back of the brain, others in processing sounds, the auditory cortex. The auditory cortex. <laughs> well, others are involved in storing and retrieving memories, such as the hippocampus. In a reply to Comte in 1865, the British philosopher John Stuart Mill anticipated the idea that self-awareness might also depend on the interaction of processes operating within a single brain, and was thus legitimate target of scientific study. Now thanks to the advent of powerful brain imaging technologies such as functioning magnetic resonance imaging, we know that when we self-reflect, particular brain networks indeed crackle into life, and that damage or disease to these same networks can lead to devastating impairments of self-awareness. I often think that if we were not so thoroughly familiar with our own capacity for self-awareness, we would be gobsmacked that the brain is able to pull off this marvelous conjuring trick. Imagine for a moment that you are a scientist on a mission to study new life forms found on a distant planet. Biologists on Earth are clamoring to know what they're made of and what makes them tick. But no one suggests just asking them. And yet a Martian landing on Earth, after learning a bit of English or Spanish or French, could do just that. The Martians might be stunned to find that we can already tell them something, what it's like to remember, dream, laugh, cry, or feel elated or regretful, all by virtue of being self-aware. But self-awareness did not just evolve to allow us to tell each other, and potentially Martian visitors, <laughs> visitors about our thoughts and feelings. Instead, being self-aware is central to how we experience the world. We not only perceive our surroundings, we can also reflect on the beauty of a sunset, wonder whether our vision is blurred, and ask whether our senses are being fooled by illusions or magic tricks. We not only make decisions about whether to take a new job or whom to marry, we could also reflect on whether we made a good or bad choice. We not only recall childhood memories, but we can also question these memories might be mistaken. <laughs> this stuff is great. I love this fucking article. Maybe I should have led with this, but... All right, it's not an article. It's an excerpt from a book. Self-awareness also enables us to understand that other people have minds like ours. Being self-aware allows me to ask, how does this seem to me? And equally important, how will this seem to someone else? Literary novels would become meaningless if we lost the ability to think about the minds of others and compare their experience to our own. Without self-awareness, there would be no organized education. We would not know who needs to learn or whether we have the capacity to teach them. The writer Vladimir Nabokov elegantly captured this idea that self-awareness is a catalyst for human flourishing. There's a quote. Being aware of being aware of being. In other words, if I not only know that I am, but also know that I know it, then I belong to the human species. All the rest follows the glory of thought, poetry, a vision of the universe. In that respect, the gap between ape and man is immeasurably greater than the one between amoeba and ape. Well, that's where that quote comes from. In light of these myriad benefits, it's not surprising that cultivating accurate self-awareness has long been considered a wise and noble goal. In Plato's dialogue, Shamides, Socrates, uh, Socrates, you know, I've got that fucking movie in my head, my head. <laughs> Bill and Ted has just returned from fighting in the Polynesian Pol War. On his way home, he asked a local boy, Shamides, if he has worked out the meaning of sophrosine, the Greek word for temperance or moderation, and the essence of a life well lived. After a long debate, the boy's cousin, Critias, suggests that the key to sophrosine is simple, self-awareness. Socrates summed up his argument, then the wise or temperate man, and he only, will know himself, and be able to examine what he knows or does not know. No other person will be able to do this. That I murdered that, but... <laughs> Likewise, 
The ancient Greeks were urged to know thyself by a prominent inscription carved into the stone of the Temple of Delphi. For them, self-awareness was a work in progress and something to be striving towards. This view persisted into medieval religious traditions. For instance, the Italian priest and philosopher St. Thomas Aquinas suggested that while the God who knows himself by default, we need to put in time and effort to know our own minds. Aquinas and his monks spent long hours engaged in silent contemplation. Contemplation. They believed that only by participating in concerned, a concerted self-reflection could they ascend towards the image of God. <laughs> yeah, I find religious shit bullshit so funny. A similar notion of striving towards self-awareness is seen in Eastern traditions such as Buddhism. The spiritual goal of enlightenment is to dissolve the ego, allowing more transparent and direct knowledge of our minds acting in the here and now. The founder of Chinese Taoism, Lao Tzu, captured this idea, gaining self-awareness is one of the highest pursuits when he wrote, To know that one does not know is best. Not to know, but to believe that one knows is a disease. To know that one does not know is best. Not to know, but to believe that one knows is a disease. Today, there is a plethora of websites, blogs, and self-help books that encourage us to find ourselves and become more self-aware. The sentiment is well meant, but while we are often urged to have better self-awarenesses, awareness, little attention is paid to the how self-awareness actually works. I find this odd that it would be strange to encourage people to fix their cars without knowing how the engine works, or to go to the gym without knowing which muscles to exercise. This book aims to fill this gap. I don't pretend to give any pithy advice or quotes to put on a poster. Instead, instead, I aim to provide a guide to the building blocks of self-awareness, drawing on the latest research from psychology, computer science, and neuroscience. By understanding how self-awareness works, I am able to put us in a position to answer the Athenian call to use it better. All right, so that was it. Know thyself. The science, I'm giving fucking promotions to these people. I don't know, but I really love this article. And when I did my five or six articles on metacognition, you know, you could tell this is a writer, right? It really caught me, just the general gist of it. But that's it. I murdered the English language for fucking 25 minutes or whatever the hell long I'm doing this. I thank you for listening. Leave a comment, whatever, do the fucking thing. I wish everybody the best. Think about thinking, but don't get too crazy. Don't get too wrapped up in it. <laughs> Learn some breathing and meditation techniques. How to clear your mind, how to regulate things. Hope everybody's doing well. My best to you and yours.